Exhibit 3, he wanted to show you that it, sometime later, at, he was running Daniel Rodriguez at 12.40 in the afternoon. Well, it may seem, or it may be, that Daniel Rodriguez was nothing but garbage. It may be that he was somebody who was on methamphetamine. But it was also a true fact that Daniel Rodriguez lay dying in that trailer. And I guess maybe there was an utter drop of human kindness left in Sergio Virgil, who did this courageous act. Because what he did is he left. And we don't know why, as indicated in Exhibit 381, what it was that he did in his Tahoe. He was at, you were asked over and over, what is it that he needed to do? Why did he leave? Well, take a look at what he did. And remember, this is from his CAD report from his Tahoe that they introduced themselves. 1237, it says, and they even mention it themselves, 998, roll fire, that same time, 1239, one subject has been shot, is down, barely alive, clear GHSE now. House is clear, fire coming slow, come in, slow it down. Now you know what he was doing. Perhaps just because to them he's a piece of garbage and somebody who's on methamphetamine, he doesn't deserve what the people in Scottsdale do, which is when they are dying, you call the fire department. That's what you do. You do that with people that are alive. You don't just say, come in here and you say, those are throwaways. You know, let's not go ahead and call fire. And let's come in here and point a finger at Sergio Virgilio and say, well, what is it that he's doing? This person who would not back up, according to them, Richard Christman, is the individual who's conscientious throughout this whole thing, and was the backup, and was the person who was watching and had the courage to stand up and come in and tell you what happened. You were also privy today to a demonstration right here, right about this area here, where there was a piece of wood that was grabbed, or one of the lures had a piece of wood, and they talked about depth of perception. And they talked to you about how it, it could have appeared as if the defendant never really did place the gun to the left temple of Daniel Rodriguez. And to, then they argued to you and told you that, well, it could just as well have been that that injury was caused to the left side as Mr. Rodriguez was going down after he had been shot. Because he went down after he was shot. No indications whatsoever that there was any going down in that area. Mr. Rodriguez went down by the couch, went down in these areas here, but never down by that chair. Well then, how is it that they explain to you, again, the flow of blood? You gotta look at the forensic evidence, and again, it is a fantasy world that they live in. And they want you to join them in that fantasy world. Take a look at Exhibit 126. We don't need an extra camera to look at that. We don't need extra resolution for you to see. You see that corner? The corner that they told you that he fell and hit his left temple? Well, if he's been shot and he's going down and you've seen all of this blood that he has on him, look at that, everywhere. You look to the right, 158, blood everywhere. Well, bloody as you see in Exhibit 94. Take a look at the chair there again. Same condition. How is it then that if he's bleeding and it's coming out, it's only going towards the door area? Because that's when he's going down. And they want you to believe that if he's going down in this position and hits himself on the left side of the head, that's how that was caused. But if that were the case, with all the blood that's coming out there, wouldn't you see some blood there? And wouldn't you see some blood on the carpet right here? Because if he's going down on his left side bleeding, and then of course he's going to have to get up as he's already down. Because that's what their scenario requires. That he's going down on his left side like this, 
bleeding all over the place, although there's no blood there. It's that magical blood again that I talked to you on already during my initial closing argument. There's no blood there. They want you to believe that somehow he's going down on his left side. He's already been shot. He's bleeding everywhere. You can see the blood right down here. I'm not anywhere there. It is a physical impossibility. Hmm. Chair to be in such pristine condition, and for them to argue, even argue to you that that's where he got the bruise. Jeffrey Johnson, the medical, the medical examiner, told you there was a bruise there. And the only way throughout this whole scenario that that could have happened, anything that's been presented other than what was just told to you, was that the gun went there. In addition, and that's a left temple, in addition to that, Kathleen Stoller told you that on the muzzle of that gun there was some DNA. Didn't get any reportable results, but there was some DNA there. And the only explanation, if you put the two together, then it's gun. They may stand up here, do all this demonstration all, all the time. They can do it all day, but it does not explain the fact there wasn't any blood to the victim's left, and there wasn't any blood on the arm. If he was going down, that would require him, once he was down here hitting himself, to get up, turn around, and lay down. That didn't happen. They also tell you, well, with regard to the bicycle, this bicycle here, it's in 39. You see how it landed? On that flower pot, we tell you? Look at that. That's indicative of it bouncing up on that. Well, <coughs> I want you to consider, but there's something they want you to forget. Do you remember when uh, Dominic Barrios, the other police officer, testified? He not only testified about the taser, he not only testified about the tablet, but he also testified about the wheel of the bike. And he said, that's been moved. They want you to believe that that's how it landed, but a police officer with the Phoenix Police Department indicated that's not the position that he saw minutes after he arrived on the scene. So they want you to believe all of that, even though you live in this fanciful world, even though you believe some people, you don't believe other people, and then you talk about bouncing bicycles when nothing has indicated that. They also talk to you about well, the left palm of the, of, the, of the left area, or palm area, and perhaps the worst area of the victim that, well, you can see through there if you look really closely that somebody may have checked for a pulse. Can you, seriously, can any of you, if you look at that, you know that at all? Anybody? Yes, there was medical care. Do we really know who actually, anybody touched them there? There was somebody from the fire department that came in there. Do we really know who it was? They want you to believe that it was the uh, defendant. So you're, you're left with these issues, and then you this issue. Then, then you're confronted with, well, but the key to this whole thing is the taser. The tasers and the confetti that came out of them is, is really the holy grail to this whole case. They want you to believe that somehow this confetti that came out is the most important thing in the world because according to Officer Virgilio, he said, I dropped it near the door. He never said inside or outside. He may have been asked, it could have been in the, in the inside, it could have been in the back, but near the door. By the statement that they showed you, that's what he said. It was near the door. We also know with regard to uh, Officer Barrios, he told you that, well, when I got there, the tablet was to the left, the taser was to the right, and it was near the breach of the door, which, again, Butcher says what uh, Officer Virgil said, but then you see later that they switched. How about that? They don't want to talk about a fanciful world, Well, in this real world, things like that, there's no magician that switches things, there's only people that do that, and that was done in this case for a Phoenix police officer that came in and testified. They tell you, well, the aphids, those are the answer. How is it that these three people could have colluded, could have, could have come together to make up this story or grab the aphids and throw them? The state never said that anybody threw the aphids there. The state indicated to you, for example, that when Myra Hawkins came in and testified, she was previous to that, and she had been in this courtroom when Virgil testified. She's the individual that told you that some distance away, maybe six, eight, nine feet away, the possibility 
that that's where she saw the aphids. Well, Officer Argento wasn't shooting in that direction. We know he was shooting in this direction because he actually struck Mr. Rodriguez. Additionally, we know that Officer Rudy, who did write a report, who didn't mention these aphids, sort of kind of agreed with her. We're not saying that they threw any aphids there for this detective to pick up. We're just saying that's what they said. Where's the proof? Where is the proof other than their word that that's where those aphids were? If we're going to take their word, why don't we take Julia Gia's word then? What makes Julia Gia any better or any worse than, than theirs? In life, usually, keeping it simple is the best thing. And in this particular case, the simplest answer to this is that nobody threw any aphids out there. Nobody did anything like that. The simplest answer is that those individuals that came in and testified, no, none of the three wrote it down in their report. They're all Johnny come lately that talk to you about it. And how much trust are you going to have in them, especially since Julia Gia, for example, was removed for saying things to the defendant like, I'm sorry? How about uh, Myra Hawkins when she said, well, yeah, before I came up here, I sort of hugged the defendant's wife. And then you have the other officer whose report is being used to buttress this, being the only person present when somehow the taser and the tablet switch positions. Those are problematic areas for them. And so when you do consider this instruction that is given to you on page 9 that was shown to you. If you find the state has lost, destroyed, or failed to preserve, are they really out there? Who are you going to believe? If you believe that Gia, that they were over here, then you're going to have to disbelieve the other two. These things just don't travel by themselves. And if you believe the other two, then you have to disbelieve a Gia. And if all of that fails, then you have to disbelieve what Barrio said, because he said they were in the doorway, which makes more sense because there was actually a strike to Mr. Rodriguez. So has the state lost, destroyed, or failed to preserve evidence? You have to show that the evidence was there. And do you feel any confidence with those three that the, those agents were there? Of course not. And are its contents or quantity important to the issues of this case? State stands behind its statements. How important could they possibly be with, with regard to this case, especially on or near the door? Right here is this area near the front door. Right here is the last door that you have. I look at example 65, it's the same thing. And there's those aphids there. Well, nobody else was near that front door, whether in or out, at the time that the taser was fired on the officer Virginia. So he's the one that fired that. If you remember, the defendant said he was over here when he fired the taser. Much was made of the fact that, well, Officer Virgil said that he believed that Chrisman's taser actually struck Mr. Rodriguez. Totally wrong. How could he possibly have been right? Because it was malfunctioning. The taser was malfunctioning. Well, that, that's true. The taser was malfunctioning. But did Officer Chrisman at that point give the impression that it had struck Daniel Rodriguez? Sure. And how do you know that? Because Jeffrey Johnston told you, the medical examiner. Again, you have to go back to medical science. And you, and you know that because he said on the side, on the side of Daniel Rodriguez appears to be injuries consistent with a taser. They forgot about that when they were talking to you about this. Chrisman himself said he was down there at the time after he filed, fired the taser. So if Daniel Rodriguez is down immediately after the taser is fired, who wouldn't think that the taser actually struck him? Who wouldn't think that? Chrisman mm -hmm. certainly didn't think that. He thought he was down. And he went down there and started to tase him. That's how the events unfolded. So with the aid, if you will, of, of uh, Jeffrey Johnston, you again have to rely on his statement going against medical science. It's easy to stand up here and make these grandiose somewhat uh, 
out of this world kind of statements, but when you bring them to the light of day, it is clear, as in this case, that they just don't measure up, and you again have to go stretch credulity, and you have to stretch it to the point where it really just doesn't make sense. The other issue that was made much of is that, well, there was this 911 call that was made, and there was 911 call indicated three times. Biblical proportions, such as when uh, St. Peter denied Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Three times she said he was violent. It's not not because that's sort of uh, three times said over and over. That's something that is significant. Well, it is an aspect of the case. But again, if the defendant doesn't know about it, how important is it? How important is it if he doesn't know that that's what she said? And that 911 tape... The officers never heard it. What the officers knew going in, if you take a look at Exhibit 282, this is what they knew. Son Daniel Rodriguez yelled at the complainant, do something from his room, hit the wall, damaged the wall, complainant calling for the neighbors, Lot 50, unknown, drinking and drugs. Two times dog and the roll home boss number 51. That is what they knew. Yes, they want to inflame your passions. They want you to come up to their pulpit. They are here with what, 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 what they are claiming from their pulpit. They want you to hear that. But unfortunately, the defendant's ears, neither were his nor uh, Officer Virgil, subject to that. How can you say that that formed part of his lexicon of knowledge if he didn't know about it? Same thing with the guns that were found in, not the guns, but the shotgun shells and the rounds that were found in the room. What difference does it make to here if he didn't know about it? Then they switch it a little. They say, no, the importance of that was not to show that Richard Christman had a fear. No, no. Shotgun shells, rounds, all that. Well, they were out. He was really, really worried about her. Didn't want to leave her there. You know, because he's such a caring, compassionate individual, right? Except that this caring, compassionate individual that they want to portray to you goes up to her and says, you know, I really can't understand what you're saying. And yes, this one of the witnesses that they called, that they called, said he was being rude when he was doing this. This person who now wants to say he was so compassionate and just doing his job and cared about her is the same person that was rude to her then. What is the more pristine, if you will, emotion and view of what he was thinking then? What he tells you today, he says, oh, all I did was care about her. You know, that's why I couldn't walk away. Or the person that was seen by a third person being rude and hustling off to the front of that door. He didn't care about her then. It's really uh, unappetizing to think that he, that, that he wants to feed that to you and says that he cares about her now. That's not what the facts show then, and that's what's important in this particular case. The other sort of assault in this case was on Sergio Virgil. And they went to great lengths to talk about a certain number of areas where they claimed that he was deficient. One of the issues involved the taser, where it fell. And he said it was near the door. And then they showed you uh, the transcript that said that he was asked, well, you know, the case wasn't there now. And he was asked by the prosecutor, could it have been Richard Christman who moved it? To his credit, to his credit, he was honest. He could have said, he kicked it. Didn't say that, did he? Didn't point the finger at a time when he could have. He could have taken the shot, but he was honest to the end. And he said, I don't know. I know somebody moved it. I don't know. But he didn't overstep his bounds. The same thing with regard to the issue of the dog. It would have been easy for him to say, walking in, oh yeah, not afraid of the dog at all. But if you remember, he said context. Yes, in the beginning, when you're looking in, you're not sure about what the dogs are going to do. But then once I saw what was going on, no, the dogs were not a threat. No, I was not afraid of the dogs. Yes, in the beginning he was. If you take things out of context, of course, 
it's going to sound like he's afraid of dogs. And then you have Julia Gia coming in, and they, there was an issue involving her about whether or not his um, family member had had a dog do something to them. So, does that mean that he, all of a sudden, just because of that, couldn't go into the trailer? No. And when it's to their benefit that he's in the trailer, of course he's in the trailer. But when it's not to their benefit, he's not in the trailer. When the OC spray is deployed, oh yeah, he's in the he's in the trailer then because that's to their benefit. But you know, this guy was chicken. He was scared. But when it's to their benefit, he's inside. And then he had to run away. But when it's not to their benefit, even though when he shoots the taser, oh no, he wasn't inside. You can't have it both ways. Either he was inside or he wasn't inside, and they're not giving the testimony the credit that it deserves. The other issue is involving the telephone call. They brought in Sean Madsen, the union organizer, or whatever it is that he does for the union working of the, uh, the, the taxpayer. One of the things that they said, well, you know, he did have a phone number, and, and he did have Mr. Madsen's phone number. And he called Mr. Madsen, and he also, there were text messages that were exchanged between them. So, no one ever denied that he had that number didn't look at it, he was paying attention when he was doing the call, when he was going to do whatever it was he was going to do. But it could have been his sergeant, and he decided to answer the call, and when it wasn't, he hung it up. They also said, well, you said that he was inked up. Yeah, that's what he said about Daniel Rodriguez initially. And if you're going to believe him about the fact that Daniel Rodriguez was inked up when he walked in there, perhaps after the gun had been pointed at him, then why wouldn't you believe Sergio Virgilio when he says that that changed? That changed because I started to talk to him. And when I started to talk to him, that's when he came down. That's when he was going to leave. You can't have it both ways, you, ways where you choose to believe in one, one time and not another time. It's a consistency thing here. The issue also was who arrived first. Well, who did arrive first? Well, according to Sergio Virgil, they arrived about the same time. And his top was parked there first, which indicates that he was there first. They wanted him to say, well, no, you know, he, he just was, was going back and forth with regard to that issue. No, he wasn't going back and forth with regard to that issue. He was always consistent about it. The other thing they said, and which is really sort of at the crux of their argument, the real argument is that if they want to show motive, they want to show well, that there is a reason why Brazil would come forth with the story. Uh, they said something to the effect of, well, if it got out that he wasn't an effective cover person, and the words were something to the effect of, who would work with him at that point? Well, let's turn the point to the other side. If he's the person who's come forward and said this, and he has had, for example, visits from Tom Madsen to bring over this clipboard. And all of this has taken place. Do you think that anybody wants to work with him now? A benefit. Have they shown that he has received? Do you think people are lining up to work with Officer Sergio Virgilio? Do you really think that that's what's going on? Oh, they said he was afraid that people wouldn't work with him before. He could have at any point in the last year said, you know, I was mistaken. I really was. Thinking about it, I was mistaken. As you can see from everything that he did, he's an individual that has courage and has stood up for all of what he believed from then until now. Well, other things that they talked to you about was, well, and most of it had to do with the aphids, but what about the expert witnesses? They talked to you about Lucian Hagen, who was asked about sooting and stippling. As you now know, there's a difference between sooting and stippling. Sooting is the uh, 364. Little puffs of smoke are coming up. Stippling. We got these. 
And he was asked a compound question about the sodium and the stippling, and they're saying, see, he doesn't even know the difference between sodium and stippling. And so you shouldn't believe a single solitary thing he has to say, even though the expert that they want you to believe, Vincent DeMaio, says that he's the preeminent expert in the United States in Chicago and reconstructions, uh, shooting reconstructions. The other thing with regard to Vincent DeMaio, one of the things that they omitted to tell you when they told you to, to sort of take in and believe everything he has to say and have you disregard what's in the wall. They told, he told you in response to a jury question that, well, when the bullet travels through the body, it pretty much keeps a straight line. Even though it may start to tumble, the bullet, when it goes in, it still has a straight line. If it does have a straight line, then it can go out uh, in the trajectory that it was uh, fired. And that makes the ending point something important to measure. They did uh, end their presentation by talking to you about the charges in this particular case, and they did make reference to the jury <coughs> They told you that there was no aggravated assault here. And they told you that there was no aggravated assault here because each number six, the defendant intentionally placed another person in reasonable apprehension of physical injury. And that even though Sergio Virgilio said shock, shock really doesn't translate, or is it reasonable apprehension? Isn't that just another name for it? But it isn't. And again, they want you to believe Sergio Virgilio when it's to their benefit, or perceived benefit, but not when it hurts them. And it, but it's not Sergio Virgilio's uh, view that matters. It's your view of the circumstances and the case involving a situation where a gun is used and placed on somebody's head. Well, no one can debate that that certainly would be a shocking event. It would be a concerning event, and that's what reasonable apprehension is. And yes, that is met here, because the defendant did use a handgun. In terms of the charge involving the cruelty to animals, clearly there, prove that the defendant intentionally or knowingly killed Junior, in the care and custody of, obviously it was the victim, without legal privilege or consent of the owner. They're saying, well, legal, he had legal, legal privilege to do that. What kind of legal privilege is that? The only people really that have a legal privilege, again, are those, for example, with the, uh, with the animal societies that can come out there. There is an issue, is that, was that in self-defense? They didn't raise it to you. Was that self-defense? It wasn't in self-defense because the dog was far away, was never a threat, and the second shot was taken and hitting the dog in the back. And he would continue shooting the dog had he been in self-defense. And lastly, the other question, jury instruction that they talked to you
Right? So the same lasting effect on there? No, you're not going to see that. It is a nonsensical story that they have brought forth for you to consider in the hopes that someone, maybe one of you, will say maybe, maybe, you know, if we start talking and there's no basis for the talking or no reason for them to actually believe this, then somebody might think that um, this is a situation that deserves a not guilty verdict. And they do things that, even though the jury instructions tell you you are not to decide on sympathy, they, show, they walk over to where, where um, Richard Christman is and they begin to talk about some of his attributes. Again, trying to talk about sympathy. And they try to talk to you and saying, you know, it's his life. I want you to be careful with it. I'm asking you to exercise more care in rendering this verdict of guilty than the care he showed for the life of another individual, Daniel Rodriguez. John Dunn said it best, not in the long and some of the words to apply to this case, but when he wrote, every person's death diminishes. So therefore, send no one to find for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Oh, many people, after you got the Ernest Hemingway, it was actually John Dunn who wrote that first. And with regard to this particular case, if we're going to use that analogy, the bell has rung on two occasions. It certainly rung for Sergio Virgil. And he answered that bell. He did not sweep this under the rug, even though there is a whole department that's involved, the City of Queens Police Department. He stood up, he was counted, and he had the courage to say, this is what I saw. Whip it what you will. And he came in and he testified. That same, same bell now rings for you. And all I'm asking you is to apply the facts that are in this case, absolutely without a shadow of a doubt, so that this individual committed these crimes that he's charged with. I'm asking that you return the verdict of guilty because the law tells you that that's what you should do based on these facts. Thank you. If you go to page nine, finish up with the instructions. The case is now submitted to you in your decision. When you go to the jury room, you will choose a four person. He or she will preside over your deliberations. Each of you must decide the case for yourself but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest convictions as to weight or effect of evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. If all 12 of you agree on a verdict, only the four person needs sign it on the line marked four person. Your schedule from this point on is up to you to collectively decide. It will be up to you when to take a break from deliberations and for how long. I only ask that once you've made a scheduling decision, you notify the bailiff so that she can inform the rest of us. Remember that you can only deliberate in the jury room and only when you are all present. If you have a question during your deliberations, the form should be signed by the foreperson dated and submitted in writing to the bailiff without any indication of the status of the jury's deliberation or any numerical division. The bailiff will get it to me and I will discuss it with the attorneys. If we can answer your questions, we will. However, just as during the trial, the law may not permit us to answer all of your questions you may ask. Remember that you not to tell. You are not to tell anyone, including me, how you stand numerically or otherwise until after you have reached a verdict or you have been discharged. During your deliberations, you must not communicate with or provide any information to anyone by any means about this case. You may not use your, any electronic device or media such as telephone, cell phone, smartphone, iPhone, Blackberry, or computer, the internet or any internet service, or any text or instant messaging service, 
or any internet chat room, blog, or website such as Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter to communicate to anyone any information about this case or to conduct any research about this case until I accept your verdict. One of the things that was said is, well, I told you at the beginning, you're going to be given exhibits that are in bags. If they are in a bag, please keep them in the sealed bag. If you want to open it, that's a question that you'll need to present out, and then we'll make arrangements that that will be done. As silly as it seems, don't bring a ruler. Uh, uh, if, the, if you need a ruler, ask for it. It's a question that will be dealt with uh, through the lawyers and then answered. So the only evidence that you can examine is the evidence is in the jury room in the form that you're getting it. All 12 of you must agree on each verdict. All 12 of you must agree whether the verdict is guilty or not guilty. You will be given three forms of verdict on which to indicate your decision. They read as follows. Each of them have a caption. Each of them start with the language. We the jury duly impaled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oath to find the defendant as to count one second degree murder. There's a place for not guilty. There's a place for guilty. There's a place for the four person to put their name, number, and sign their name. For count two, Aggravated assault, a place for not guilty, a place for uh, guilty, a place for the four person to sign, print, and put their number. Count three, cruelty to animals, a place for not guilty, a place for guilty, a place for the four person to sign, print, and put their numbers. I told you earlier that the schedule is now up to you. It'll take us a few minutes to get you exhibits. Um, and before, before we do that, uh, two things need to be done. Let me swear in the bailiffs to take charge of the de deliberating jurors. You swear that you will take charge of this jury and protect their deliberations from all outside interference and communication. And when they have reached a verdict, you will bring them back into court without revealing their verdict to anyone. So help you God. The last thing we need to do is I'll have the clerk draw out the numbers of two uh, jurors who will be the alternates. In the unhoped, or un, um, unhoped event that a deliberating juror becomes unable to uh, complete their duties, we'll bring the alternate back in. Uh, because of that, we'll keep the alternate under the admonition. You won't be able to discuss the case. We, of course, will call you as soon as we, or uh, if your colleagues ever reach the verdict, we will call you uh, at that time. So at this time, the clerk will now draw the numbers of the two who will serve as alternates. Your number 16. Your number one. Yeah. The other jurors, if we give us a few minutes to get the exhibits, and then if you'd advise us of your, uh, of your schedule, just understand that if you tell us that there's a question, you tell us that there is a verdict, uh, these folks go on about their other business. We'll get everybody here as quickly as possible, but there may be a delay between the time that you send out a question request or the time that you advise us that there's a verdict and the time we get back into the courtroom. So we will get here as promptly as possible, but it may not be immediate. Uh, so the jurors are, are excused to begin their deliberations. Record for now, Mr. Martinez. Mr. Marins. Who was one in 16? Uh, we can give I, there's a sentencing chart, I'm not a sentencing chart, but the jury chart okay. one in um, Sean has it. Okay, thank you. But they're in the both corners. That's if I can ask Sean, that'll be fine. We can, that that's a knowable uh, question. Thank you. Other than that, nothing. We had one exhibit that was supposed to be redacted by the state. 
I don't know if that's ever been done. I haven't seen one. All right, before I was in the jury room, let's double check that. Which exhibit is that? I don't know what's there. 22. I'm just waiting for him to just cut one Right now. Okay. Off the record for a minute. Mr. Murray, I'm going to ask whether I, I'll ask you this first off the record. If there are jury questions, whether Mr. Crispin wants to be present for jury questions. I don't. No. I'm just like, I don't want to surprise you with the question. But, that's all. But let's say no, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Okay. Should there be a jury question, Mr. Marin, does Mr. Uh, Chrisman waive his appearance for a jury question? Yes, he does. All right. Uh, Mr. Chrisman, if you do get word that there's a verdict, you have come to all the court appearances. I don't expect any less to understand that you need to be here for the return of the verdict. Uh, if you're not here without an explanation, uh, a warrant could be issued and the trial could, uh, the verdict could be returned without you. Do you understand that, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. We're adjourned. If I can get just numbers and then Mr. Martinez and folks, if we, I don't know, if give me a guesstimate about how long it's going to take, if how much time we should tell the jurors if there is if a verdict, we we can get back here in X minutes. Um, I would ask. Uh, let me ask. Sure. Uh, if we could have a, between an hour and an hour and a half. All right. That, but nobody knows when and that'll work. Nobody knows whenever that may happen. But if we do get a verdict, we'll advise the jurors it'd be at least about an hour. Okay. Uh, I know we're off the record. If I can talk to counsel briefly. Hmm? <laughs>